You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. And hello, listeners. Welcome back to the Common Descent Podcast. This is episode 37. Yay! Big fans of prime numbers here at the Common Descent Podcast. I, I've also always been a fan of double-digit numbers that, when added together, make 10. I don't know why. It's just you're, always inter- it's entertained me as a kid. <laughs> a weird guy, Ace. Yeah. A weird guy. Today, our subject is the evolution of birds. Yeah. This is one of the most fascinating evolutionary stories in evolutionary history, and a fascinating story of scientific discovery. Yes. We will talk a bit about what we understand about where birds came from and how they came to be as they are today. We will talk a little bit about the history of thought and discovery on this subject. And we'll talk a bit about bird diversity, past and present. This is the number one most requested subject. Yeah, it is. In Common Descent history. This was requested. This particular subject was requested by three anonymous people on the survey, (laughs) by Dylan on Facebook, who's also one of our patrons, Cheryl, who's another one of our patrons, and a third patron suggested that we talk a bit about the history of this subject, which is why there'll be a little bit of a history spin in this episode. There was also a request very early on from another one of our patrons, Sam, who asked us to discuss Coelurosaurian dinosaurs. And this episode technically partially fulfills that request uh, within that category. Huge thanks to the thousand people that have asked for this. <laughs> Evidently, birds are popular. so People like birds. So give, them, give the people what they want, <laughs> as they say. A couple of quick announcements before we continue. Speaking of patrons... We love our patrons over at Patreon, and one of the gifts that we will give in return to certain patrons at certain levels is that we will shout their name out on the podcast. Much like you're about to hear. So I will now shout out the name of our newest patron, Mike! Normally we don't actually shout it. (laughs) Shout out is kind of an idiomatic expression. Thanks, Mike, our newest patron, for joining us on the Patreon. We appreciate your contribution. Yeah, thank you. The other quick announcement is that it is June, and all through June we are working our way through a special digression series on the Jurassic Park franchise. If you haven't seen that already, by the time this episode comes out, we should be three with By the time this episode comes out, we should be three parts down, two to go, and gearing up to get our tickets to see Fallen Kingdom releasing at the end of the month, which is just going to be a blast, I'm sure. We're very interested to see how that goes yes we are so check that out if you haven't already and if you've already checked it out then look forward to more and if you haven't become a patron yet and you think you might be interested in being a patron check that out too there's a lot of things to check out but you know what let's talk about the news some new news every episode we like to highlight a few pieces of news that have caught our eye from the world of paleontology evolutionary biology earth and life history something in that vein things that fit the podcast theme indeed today as usual we have four pieces will would you like to kick off the news i would and i would like to kick it off with a subject we've talked about recently in our episodes uh the great barrier reef oh we did a whole episode last episode about reefs so bonus sequel material you could say (laughs) This piece of news is on the release of some recent research that's been going on for a while, actually, on the Great Barrier Reef's history and how it has survived over the years and finds that over the last 30,000 years, the Great Barrier Reef has experienced five major death events, basically die-offs. Ooh, Great Reef extinctions. Yes, and the cool part is how it has survived by moving from spot to spot. So this research is done by Jody Webster et al. And it's published in Nature Geoscience. Uh, The article I'm reading is going to be in Science Daily uh, by the University of Sydney, which uh, Jody 
which Jody works at. The research is focusing on the Great Barrier Reef. They are off the coast of Australia, the largest reef today in the world. And throughout its history, it's been around for quite a while and has therefore survived major changes in the ocean's temperature, quality of the habitat, the uh, levels of the ocean, big, big changes throughout the ocean's uh, status. And how it survived that is a big question because it could actually lead a lot to helping us understand how resilient are reefs actually? How might reefs today respond to changes happening today? So since we have a living reef with a long history, they looked into it. The researchers who conducted this were at this for about 10 years. Wow. Collecting fossil reef cores from 16 different sites around Australia, specifically near Keynes and McKay. And this is basically them drilling down into fossil reef material and bringing out a plug of fossil reef. Wow, just stratified yes. reef going back through the ages. And so, and this is very common practice. They do it with ice cores uh, in Arctic areas. Uh, doing it, o ocean coring is very common to go down and take a plug out from the bottom of the ocean and looking at the layers there. This is looking at the reef's history as recorded by the fossils, the, you know, the leftover skeletons of previous corals. The data goes back over the last 30,000 years of the Great Barrier Reef, and they find that in that time, there were five major, what they call reef death events. And these are going to be times where the reef did not die off completely, but that it had a huge die-off experience. There was a huge dip in its uh, numbers or the diversity or just the size of the reef. And each of these, it bounced back mostly by moving up and down the shore yeah the reef migrations the whole reef just shifts absolutely and that shifting moves it up into shallower water or into deeper water depending on what's required so to give you kind of a play-by-play -play of what these die-offs were and what happened and what caused them uh about thirty thousand years ago and twenty two thousand years ago are the first two die-offs and both of these seem to be due to sudden sea level drops which is deadly to coral because it exposes it to air, which as a aquatic organism is not good. So yes. <laughs> it gets exposed to the air, dies off, and then the reef shifted seaward down into deeper water. Uh, and to emphasize this, reefs do not like go... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not physically moving. They used to ride these babies for miles. Uh, <laughs> it's not like that. <laughs> it's... It's that they just are growing in a direction. They are going to start growing toward the ocean. Yes. And the reef is just going to basically leave behind its old parts and the new parts are going to be over here. Slow, according, you know, compared to what we experience movement in, but fast enough to survive these events. And uh, we'll go into that a little bit later. But the next two die-offs are at 17,000 years ago and 13,000 years ago. And these are due to rapid sea level rises. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a very common threat to reefs. Uh, we talked about the fact that you can you can get what's called a drowned reef. This yep. effectively removes them too far from the sunlight. The water is now filtering out too much sun. They can't get enough light, and they just die off. That's one of the reasons that this can be bad. The reason that they actually think this was bad is due to the increased sediment that the rise caused. Interesting. So actually burying... The reef. Burying the coral, smothering it. It's it's Whether it's the fact that it's polluting the water too much to let sun through or that it's actually misting, you know, dusting over the coral and killing it by smothering it from the sun or food. Uh, same issue that having algae grow over it. So this time it moved landward to adjust for deeper waters. And then about 10,000 years ago, this is just before the modern barrier reef established about 9,000 years ago. So... This is the last die-off before the reef we now know, or the structure we now know, I should say. This one was due to massive sediment increases with some general rises in sea level. So not a drastic water level change like the last four were, but something caused a huge amount of sediment to be introduced. And it was yes. smothering the coral and killing it off. 
And that kind of sediment shift can be caused by changes in the geology of the nearby region. Absolutely. You know, there's the tons. landscape, the way that water and wind are interacting with the landscape has shifted so that now sediment is being funneled in one direction. If those of you who listened through the reefs episode remember that the reason we were surprised there was a reef near the Amazon River is that rivers are often reef killers because they're pumping sediment. Yes. And so something like a river changing direction can cause huge effects like that. This was a massive version of that. The realization that this brings the researchers to, the fact that there are these five major die-offs and yet we still have the same Great Barrier Reef surviving in that area, shows that reefs are more resilient than one would typically think. They're not just as fragile as they're often made out to be. And this actually is uh, due to, as they measure it, their ability to move fairly quickly, an average about... Hmm. 0.2 to 1.5 meters a year. Wow. Yeah, which sounds, that's still Pretty super speedy for slow. for coral reefs. But considering this is something that can typically, that a lot of them are considered to only usually grow a couple inches a year, that's actually pretty quick. So a, when a yeah. coral's in trouble, it moves, which is interesting. But even with all that, Professor Webster does say that they are not sure that even with all of that, the coral reef will be able to survive what they are experiencing nowadays. Interesting. Changes in temperature, the chain, once again, sediment is an issue due to irrigation and uh, farming and construction, water quality effects of pollution, and then things like coral bleaching and physical damage are all issues that are potentially more severe. And he, they, they point out that historically, you know, with the, the data we have, the sea level, the sea surface has shown a change in temperature of a couple of degrees Celsius over a course of about 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. With current predictions, they show a potential change of increase of 0.7 degrees Celsius over the next 100 years. Yeah. Which is not something that necessarily the corals will be able to handle. So it's it, this is hopeful, like in the fact that, wow, corals sure are tougher than we necessarily thought. Still doesn't look like they're definitely tough enough for what we're throwing yes. at them well there, there are only so many issues you can run away from yes and there are only so many issues you can run away from fast enough you can run coral but you can't hide pretty much yeah yeah like basically. you can run from sediment but you can't hide from ocean acidification yeah yeah so it's really neat to be able to you know we often talk about extinction and resilience and evolution in individual groups of organisms mm-hmm but this is a cool study that we allows us to look at the extinction, evolution, and adaptation of an ecosystem. Yeah, it's it's a living habitat, which is so bizarre, and it's it's cool to see how a habitat responds. Most definitely. Keeping things in the ocean realm, my first bit of news is about history's biggest fish. Nice. I guess I should say history's biggest fishes. And asking the question, why are the biggest fishes today the biggest fishes today? Interesting. This is research by Humberto Ferron et al. in Paleontology, the journal called Paleontology. And the article that I have pulled up, the popular article, and we'll, as always, put the articles and press releases and such in the blog post. This is at smithsonian.com by Julissa Trevino. There is this interesting question that there have been a handful of times throughout history where certain fish have gotten crazy big. Today, the largest fish are chondrichthians. That is to say, the group that includes sharks. The whale shark yes. is enormous, this enormous filter-feeding, suspension-feeding creature. But there are no bony fish that reach those sizes today. And people have wondered, is what is it about the chondrichthians that allows them to get bigger, but the bony fish cannot? Chondrichthians are cartilaginous. Is there something different there that's, that's changing this up? To try to answer that question, this group of researchers looked to a giant bony fish of the past. This is a fish called Leedsichthys problematicus. <laughs> it, too, was a giant suspension feeder the largest known ray fin fish, or at least among the largest known, lived in the late Jurassic period about 165 million years ago and is estimated to have gotten up to 
just over 50 feet long, and perhaps as heavy as 50 tons. Which is huge. This is a big fish. For comparison, the largest fish today, the ocean sunfish, gets about two and a half tons. Yeah. Or the largest uh, raifin fish, I should say. Mm-hmm. One of the suggestions that has been brought forward is that there's something about the metabolism of these fish that stops them from getting to these sizes. So these researchers compared the metabolic requirements of modern day fish to the giant lead sickthus from the past to try to estimate what would be the metabolic cost of powering this body. Could modern day style fish pull it off? And what they found is, yeah, surprisingly, that doesn't seem to be an issue. Hmm. They assert that big lead sickness, as much as 45, almost 50 tons, would be able to swim quickly. They calculated swimming speeds of 11 miles an hour. Yeah, that's significant. Without any particular problem getting oxygen, getting energy through the body because of their big size. What's interesting about this is it suggests that this hypothesis, this hypothesized explanation for the small size of modern day rafe and fish, doesn't seem to be valid, which is great. We've knocked off an option and it raises the question or maintains the question. If not that, then what? (laughs) Why aren't they big today? And they suggest that there are probably other factors that may have caused this. They suggest, for example, the structure of the endoskeleton of the fish may be limiting their growth. They also suggested that competing suspension feeders may have just taken up those ecological opportunities. That the giant ray-finned fish of the late Jurassic were able to do that because there was a niche open to do it. Mm -hmm. But in the Cenozoic, where we have never seen ray-finned fish get that big, the whale sharks are doing it actual whales are doing it and there may simply not be an opportunity for them interesting so it's a it's a it's a neat very specific case of asking a very specific question and rejecting or accepting it in this case knocking it out so we can ask other questions that's cool i like this for a couple reasons one getting to see a a situation where hypothesis is proposed hypothesis is tested hypothesis is rejected is a nice it's nice to get to see the scientific process done in in a pure way where yeah you don't always get a nice aha and we found out the answer is actually just not this one yes <laughs> <laughs> but something else it's also fun to think about from the point of view that they're looking at it in why are our fish not as big as they are because typically the first answer that almost everyone leans toward is well what's different about the environment you know what's you know, yes. there must have been a limiting factor that was imposed at some point, got too cold, the oxygen got too low for bugs, whatever it was. It's neat to think about, okay, but maybe it's something just physically that has changed or, yeah. you know, ecosystem wise are different routes that you don't typically hear about as often when talking about why things are different sizes now. Yeah, it's it's common to blame temperature yes. or atmosphere yes. or things like that or gravity, which is nonsense. There's, gravity <laughs> hasn't changed. <laughs> but to to blame the organisms themselves, <laughs> it's just, this is your fault, fish. I do like the idea that they were pushed out of filter feeding. Makes sense because it's it's you know the the fact that we don't see a lot of big filter feeding ray fin fish even on small. I mean, there are definitely filter feeders, but They usually travel in schools, not as a monster. Yes. Which is a very different shift. That's cool. So the next step will be for somebody to test that hypothesis. And we shall see. And so on and so on. My next news source deals with, uh, still in the water actually, but moving away from it. Oh. Because it deals with early tetrapods. Ooh. So early tetrapods being four-limbed organisms, animals. Mm -hmm. And this news piece is about two new ones discovered in South Africa. These are important because they are the first ones found in South Africa, and Africa in general, but they're also very important for telling us more about the early beginnings of tetrapods and where they got their starts. So tetrapod, the early tetrapods are notable because they are the first vertebrates to move out of the water. 
Yes. So these are these are those classic, you know, beginnings of the amphibians that were going from fish to four limbed in and out of the water animals. Yes. So these these seem like they were probably still in the water from what the article says, but they were definitely tetrapods. Interesting. So just getting their start moving on to yes. land. This research is done by Robert Guess and Per Eric Alberg in Science. And the article is in the conversation by Robert Guess. Mm -hmm. Tetrapods, as I mentioned, the four-limbed animals that rose from fish and came to land, first appear in the Devonian, looking at about 360-ish, 359 million years ago. And during this time, there are two supercontinents, Laurasia and Gondwana, the big famous ones, before they eventually smash together. Laurasia was the northern continent made up of North America, Greenland, and modern Eurasia. And Gondwana was the southern continent continent in the Arctic, made up of Africa, South America, Australia, Antarctica, India, and Madagascar. Mm -hmm. So basically the rest. <laughs> and Laurasia was tropical. Gondwana was... Not, it wasn't going to be Arctic. It wasn't as cold. But it was polar. It was over the Arctic Circle. And... Traditionally, for the longest time, early tetrapods were basically only found in Laurasia, except for some footprints in what would become Australia. But they were only being found in Laurasia, which led people to the assumption that they were tropical origin. They needed tropics to be coming about. It's, just, it's a logical con conclusion. These obviously disagree with that. And so these were found in South Africa, uh in a fossil deposit known as Waterloo Farm. It's a black shale deposit that pre preserves fossils very, very well from what the author was saying. And they are not only new species, but two new genera of early tetrapod discovered from a piece of the shoulder girdle. And they are named Tutusius and Umzantia. A uh, fun side note about this fossil deposit, it is actually also a rescued... Fossil site from road construction, very much like the great fossil site was. Oh, cool! Yeah, they were this in this one though. Instead of diverting, they removed tons of material and are now going through and it. Set it aside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. They discovered these, as I said, from a piece of a shoulder girdle, which is uh, unique in early tetrapods enough to identify that these are indeed limbed uh, animals, not just fish anymore. And this discovery really opens up the fact that they are not just tropical. These are, South Africa would have been directly over the Arctic Circle at the south of the planet. So this now means, A, they could be showing up anywhere, not just in the tropics, and B, people who are studying them should start looking in more than just what was yeah. Laurasia and also start to you know, potentially find them in other places. It's very exciting to learn. it's it's exciting and frustrating to have an idea in your head that a certain evolutionary event happened in a particular place yes. and then learn that that's not as true as you thought it was mhm mm it's frustrating obviously because it means you don't understand the situation as well as you thought you did yeah the nice little picture you had yeah of but it's exciting to think oh tetrapods were crawling out of the water all over the place that's pretty interesting. Which immediately makes it more complex. Yes, it does. Because now there's a whole bunch of factors that could be going into why they were crawling out. The researchers do point out uh, a neat little fact that with this, this means that South Africa contains a fossil record that that is a surprisingly good overview of the evolutionary history from fish to humans. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. Because it includes early <laughs> tetrapods, transitional spe species from reptile-like ancestors to early mammals, and the origins of humans are all found within that country, which is a really cool little grab bag That's of awesome. fossil records. If you are listening to us from Africa, be proud. You live in a cool continent. you got cool fossils. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Our last bit of news. You know, Will makes a point whenever there's crocs in the news <laughs> to talk about crocs. 
And there's way more Crocs in the news than there are Squamates. <laughs> Today I have the chance to talk about Squamate news. This is the oldest known Squamate in the fossil record. What's a Squamate? Squamates are the group of reptiles that include lizards and snakes. This the second best, the second best group that's not from true. a this, very popular poll I I heard of. It, that poll was flawed, and their <laughs> methods were, were really wonky. This is research done by Tiago Simoes et al. in the journal Nature, and the article we'll be throwing up on the podcast blog is a National Geographic article by Sarah Gibbons. Up until now, the oldest known lizard and snake fossils come from the Jurassic period, around 170 million years ago. But we can estimate when a group originated using DNA or using morphology and, you know, calculating an estimate of how long it would have taken to evolve that diversity. Yeah, that it, if things changed at a steady rate, we should see right. the earliest ones somewhere around here. And their estimated origin is back in the Triassic, as far back as almost 250 million years ago, which raises the question, where are all those early squamate fossils? Mm -hmm. These authors re-examined a fossil of a reptile that was found 20 years ago in the Italian Alps that dates back to the Middle Triassic, almost 250 million years old, a creature called Megachirella wachtleri. They did some high-resolution X-ray CT scans and created a 3D model of the fossil, which allowed them to get a better sense of its features and then throw it together into a big statistical comparison with other lizards and snakes, extinct and living, and other reptiles, which they described as the largest reptile data set ever, with 130 different squamates included in it. Wow. Their analysis suggests a number of things. First, that Megachirella is the oldest known squamate. Not part of the modern squamate groups. It's, a, it's an older branch of the squamate family tree, but an old lizard, essentially. This suggests that the squamate features, the features that make lizards and snakes what they are, showed up by the early Triassic, suggesting that the Lepidosaurs, the squamates and their close relatives, didn't originate in the Triassic, as has previously been suggested, but radiated in the Triassic. People mm. in the past have thought that the Triassic was a time where they were first showing up. Their analysis and this new fossil included in it suggests that they had already shown up before the Triassic in the late Permian, and the Triassic was when they were diversifying and evolving new forms. Oh, that's very interesting. So not only do we have an old Swamate fossil... It has reshaped our understanding of exactly how their evolutionary history has occurred, and it partially fills in this 70 million year gap yes. in the fossil record between when they appear to have originated and when we see their first fossils. Oh, that's very cool. I find it interesting, the concept of uh, the origin of a group and the diversification of a group being easily confused when looking at the fossil record. It's it that's a really neat it's, it'd be kind of like if a new product came out and then later on people started copying it and you started seeing similar products all over and one of those similar products was the first time someone else ever met it. Yes. This, for them that would be like the origin of it and that's that's a cool concept. It super complicates <laughs> trying to read fossil records. Yes it does. <laughs> but that's really cool. I also like that they were able to use just a huge data set statistical analysis. That's one of my favorite times is when those just massive amounts of data gets to be used. It's like that data for data's sake comes into use in these big statistical analysis. Yes. In fact, one of the interesting implications of their analysis, and this, if there are any fans of phylogeny or reptiles out there, <laughs> the consensus of the relationships between lizards based on most morphological fossil studies has suggested that the iguanians, iguanas, chameleons, agamids, and so on, are the first branching group off of the lizard family tree, the most basal, the, 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 the out group. Mm -hmm. This huge analysis with this new fossil suggests that it is instead geckos. Oh. 
this is very esoteric niche yeah yeah information i only mention it here because that's ridiculous <laughs> that's yeah that's they rearranged the entire lizard family tree slightly <laughs> they huh. they switched one group with the other in terms of order of evolutionary origin which is interesting to me and maybe to some other people in the audience yep. <laughs> and both of you listening both yes <laughs> to me and those two other people that's that that's really interesting geckos geckos who knows then again the lizard family tree is all turmoil so, hey, <laughs> check, who knows check in next week will let's talk about birds well, all right So, with the news out of the way, we can move on to our main topic, which today is the evolution of birds. Boids. Let's start off by discussing what birds are. Most of you listeners are probably very familiar with birds. Birds are among the most successful tetrapods mm -hmm. in the world. There are approximately 10,000 species of living birds. For comparison, that is approximately twice the number of species of mammals. Yeah. Birds are crazy diverse. They live everywhere. Not, you know, a lot of the times we'll say, like, these are found on almost all the continents. Almost. Birds are found on pretty much every landmass. Like, every little island in the ocean is very likely to have birds living on it. Birds are one of the... Are... One of those organisms, one of those facets of modern world and habitats. If you try to picture a world without birds, it's it's weird. It's one of the easiest ways to make a sci-fi planet feel alien. <laughs> yes, no birds. No birds. It's weird. <laughs> birds are also insanely diverse. You've got the little birds that we're familiar with, you know, flying around our neighborhoods. You've got huge birds that soar over the oceans. You've got giant flightless birds mm -hmm. you've got tiny flightless birds birds that swim birds that burrow birds that live on islands birds that live on shores birds that live in desert like birds are everywhere yeah. they're incredibly diverse from penguins to ostriches to sparrows to hawks and eagles this is it, it, more than any other group we have zeroed in on up to this point living group birds are, are absolute masters of diversity Birds are, they, I've always felt when looking at the variety of birds, that the only reason we see them all as the same group is because we know that they are. But if you were to like introduce them to an alien race and be like, here's a penguin, here's an ostrich, here's a sparrow, they're all the same group. They'd be like, no, they're not. Stop messing with us. <laughs> you shut up. These, these humans are jerks and they're trying to prank us. Now, one of the ways we know they're all the same group is that they share a number of characters. Here are some of the things, not all the things, my goodness, but some <laughs> of the things that make birds birds. Uh, birds are extremely unique. They're unlike anything else in the world. You know, everything's, got, you know, all groups of animals are unique, but they are all similar to other animals in at least some ways, some closer than others. The closest relatives of birds are crocodiles. Woo! That's how strange and unique birds are. Yep. So some of the characters that are iconic to birds famously they have pneumatized bones mm -hmm. that is to say that their bones are made sturdy and lightweight by being full of hollow spaces honeycombed they're honeycombed they, they're thick in certain spots and very open and porous in other spots so that they can add strength without adding weight to the skeleton yeah it's it's a common thought that it is to lighten the bone. They're not removing material, they're reorganizing it. Yes, it allows you to strengthen bone without making it heavier. Mm -hmm. Another way that they strengthen their skeleton is by fusing lots of bones. <laughs> just, just all over the place. So their skulls, for example, instead of being made up of many different individual pieces like many animals are, their skull bones tend to be very fused. Their pelvic region is one huge fused unit. Other parts of their vertebrae are fused. A lot of their limb bones are fused. So where some animals would have leg bone, ankle bones, foot bones, birds have combined a lot of those. Yes. Same thing in the hands and the, the arms. 
they're this sort of combi combining and fusing to strengthen certain elements. Birds have beaked jaws, and no birds today have true teeth. There are birds that have weird, spiky nonsense, but there's no true <laughs> teeth in birds. Bird chests feature an enormous sternum with this huge keel on it that supports the flight muscles. Mm -hmm. Thing like the, the front of a boat with like a blade almost. Yes, it's a big blade. Flightless birds do not have this, but flighted birds use this to anchor their flight muscles. Bird tails, uh, they don't have long tails, right? Most, a lot of animals have those sort of long tails. Birds have a structure called a pygostyle, mm -hmm. which is a little nub of fused tail vertebrae that supports a fan of tail feathers. Yes. Also, of course, birds have very long and strong arms, mm -hmm. which support their wings. Once again, this is the case for most birds. Some birds are flightless and have nubby little ridiculous tiny arms because <laughs> they're not flying with them. So birds have all sorts of unique skeletal features. They also have other features of their soft tissue and physiology. Birds have very high metabolism. They are, quote, warm-blooded. Yep. A lot of those hollow spaces in their vertebrae and other bones are full of air sacs that help to make up part of their unidirectional respiratory system. That is, we humans, we breathe in, we breathe out through the same tubes. Like a breathing in and out of a bag. Yes. Birds don't. Birds have a circuit, and the air goes through the loop so that the old air and the new air are never mixing. It's a much more efficient breathing system. Much more efficient. Birds have a four-chambered heart. Birds are covered in feathers and scales. Mm -hmm. And then there are some behaviors that are common among birds. Obviously, flight is what birds are famous for. Birds are commonly very social. Birds are commonly very good parents. All of these are features that combined make up sort of the characteristic set of traits that we associate with birds. When we're looking at the evolution of birds, these are the features we're looking at. Where did these come from? Where did these come into play? And that brings us to the question of the relationships of birds. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of discovering the relationships of birds, but this is as we understand it today. Birds are dinosaurs. Yep. Not they're descended from dinosaurs, not they're related to dinosaurs. Birds are dinosaurs. Yes. They are a branch of the dinosaur family tree. Their closest relatives among the other dinosaurs are probably the dromaeosaurs and the troodontids. Yeah. These are mostly small, carnivorous, very bird-like dinosaurs. Yeah, Two-legged. Covered in feathers, long arms, running on two legs. Velociraptor is a dromaeosaur. Mm -hmm. Troodon is a troodontid. Small carnivore, mostly carnivorous. Uh, all or most of them have those killer sickle claws that you recognize from Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. These are the closest cousins of birds. They belong to the theropod dinosaurs, which is the group of dinosaurs that are mostly bipedal and carnivorous. T-Rex, Spinosaurus, Allosaurus, and so on. And dinosaurs themselves belong to the major group of reptiles called archosaurs. Yes. There are two main branches of archosaurs. One includes the dinosaurs and the pterosaurs. The other was the focus of episode two. Yeah. When we talked about crocodilians. <laughs> so though they are distantly related, the only two surviving members of the archosaurs are crocs and birds. And that's family tree-wise why they're related and then... As we, I'm sure I mentioned in episode two, but I don't remember that far back. <laughs> you also see similarities in that they both have the four-chambered heart, the unidirectional breathing, and then very social, yep. good parents, very vocal. So yes. you see some of those, those key things that pop up in their relation. Yes, they may be very different now, but they hold those evidences of their shared heritage, which is cool. But that's enough about dumb old Crocs. Let's talk about birds. Hey. <laughs> And bird evolution. Crocs are, Crocs are pretty cool. <laughs> Second best group of reptiles, according to a poll conducted by me, for me, and I did it. <laughs> the story of bird evolution, and we're going to talk about the story itself, the history, has to begin with a fossil creature called Archaeopteryx. One of the most famous fossils just ever. Oh, yeah, possibly the most famous fossil in history. I mean, yeah, there, there definitely could be an argument made for that because it's, it's ridiculous. Archaeopteryx is a small bird <laughs> discovered 
from limestone in Germany that dates to the very late Jurassic, around 150 million years ago. So the same time that Stegosaurus and Brachiosaurus were clumping around. Archaeopteryx is about the size of a raven. It is covered in feathers. Even in the fossils, you can see the imprints of the feathers around the body. Has long arms that were clearly supporting wing feathers. Two-legged, curvy neck, definitely looks like a bird. But the fingers are not fused the way they are in birds, and they end in these big claws. Mm -hmm. Archaeopteryx has a long tail, which, as we discussed, not something you see in birds. Archaeopteryx has teeth in its mouth, which is <laughs> weird. Archaeopteryx also has those killer claws yeah. on its feet. Archaeopteryx is this strange mixture which today doesn't strike us as all that strange, but when it was first discovered, this was an unusual combination of traits. It's it's kind of the poster child for that, that missing link scenario where it is seemingly yes. half and half stuck between two worlds. Yes, it's got features that are definitely bird, and it's got features that are definitely not. Yeah, I, I, my, my favorite of them is the feathered tail with bone running through it. It's such yes. a weird... It's like, it, that's <laughs> such a... a if so, if you had someone draw the skeleton of a bird just by looking at the outside, you would put a bone through their long feathered tail, and this one actually has that going down it. Yes, yes. The first fossil of Archaeopteryx ever described was actually a single feather, described in 1861. The first skeleton was discovered around the same time. It is called the London specimen, because that's where it ended up. Also the Yervogel specimen which gave us a great glimpse of Archaeopteryx's body, although it did not have most of the head and neck. The next specimen, the second skeleton, discovered and identified as Archaeopteryx, was found in the mid-1870s, preserving the head, including those teeth. Yes. This is known as the Berlin specimen, and if you have ever seen a famous Archaeopteryx skeleton, this is probably the one. This is the, it's got the head tilted back in classic pose, Wings spread out to the sides. This is the iconic Archaeopteryx specimen. It's a it's a ridiculously beautiful fossil. It's so it's so great. And not only it would be beautiful if it wasn't the iconic yes. transitional fossil, but it is. Note that Archaeopteryx that first skeleton was discovered in 1861, two years after Darwin published on the Origin of Species in 1859. And people started looking at it in that light. Mm -hmm. This is a creature that seems to combine features of birds and features of reptiles. One classic version of this story that you might hear, the sort of quick, short, simple version, is that Archaeopteryx was discovered. Paleontologists and biologists looked at it and said, wow, well, that's a, either a very bird-like reptile or a very reptile-like bird. And then no one could figure out what it was until a century later where we finally discovered, oh, oh, okay, there, it's linked to dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Not actually the case. Over the century between when Archaeopteryx was first discovered and analyzed and the dinosaur renaissance that finally cemented the bird linked to dinosaurs, there were several suggestions. We know this is related to, to reptiles. We've got reptile features. We've got bird-like features. Which reptiles... Does Archaeopteryx link birds too? Mm -hmm. We have called this animal the first bird. Where does it go? There were a number of different suggestions. Some people were right on the money right off the bat. Which makes sense. Famously, Thomas Henry Huxley, the famous Thomas Henry Huxley, compared Archaeopteryx specifically to a small dinosaur from around the same time period called Compsognathus. <laughs> If you've watched Jurassic Park 2, you've seen an animal very much like Compsognathus. <laughs> Small, two-legged, long tail, curvy neck, classic little dinosaur. I mean, it's basically kind of what Archaeopteryx might look like if you just removed the feathers that were around Absolutely. it. And just focused on the skeleton. Absolutely. Huxley noticed a lot of similarities between Archaeopteryx and Compsognathus and with other meat-eating dinosaurs particularly in the hips and the hind limbs. And he pointed out conversations with other researchers who have found other you know, similar notes. Archaeopteryx seems to have a lot in common with the theropod dinosaurs. This was bolstered 
by another famous 1800s paleontologist named Othniel Charles Marsh, uh, famous for being one half of the instigators of the Bone Wars. <laughs> That's a conversation for another time. In the early 1870s, Marsh discovered a number of fossils from the American West, from the Cretaceous, notably two organisms that he would later name Ichthyornis and Hesperornis. These were very clearly birds, and they very clearly had teeth. Yes. These were the first known examples, studied examples, of toothed birds. Darwin himself wrote to Marsh to tell Marsh how excited he was <laughs> that Marsh had found birds with teeth. It's a pretty cool find. And this led Marsh to add on to these suggestions by Huxley and others and say, okay, not only Archaeopteryx now, we've got mounting evidence. And I pulled a quote from a book that I have because it's just so, such a wonderful quote from Marsh. <laughs> In 1877, right, less than 20 years after Darwin published On the Origin of Species, Marsh gave a speech in Nashville at a meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which is an organization that still to this day publishes Science Magazine. And Marsh said, quote, the classes of birds and reptiles as now living are separated by a gulf so profound that a few years since it was cited by the opponents of evolution as the most important break in the animal series and one which that doctrine could not bridge over since then as huxley has clearly shown this gap has been virtually filled by the discovery of bird-like reptiles and reptilian birds compsognathus and Archaeopteryx of the Old World, and Ichthyornis and Hesperornis of the New, are the stepping stones by which the evolutionist of today leads the doubting brother across the shallow remnant of the gulf once thought impassable. End quote. That, that's fantastic. I love it so much. <laughs> I, I feel like National Treasure, people just don't talk like that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's wonderful, it's poetic, and he's dead on. He's saying... Compsognathus, Archaeopteryx, tooth birds. Yeah. There is your evolutionary progression. Well, and I love that he makes the point that this was a gap that seemed ridiculous. You know, po pointing at any reptile and pointing at a bird and going, those once looked like each other, would just seem like an insane person's ramblings. Yeah. And yet, there it is in the fossils, just once you found the right fossils, just once you finally dug in the right spot. There it was. Yes. And indeed, he compared birds to the small dinosaurs of the Jurassic. And in another quote that I don't have ex directly here, he said that the dinosaurs of that time were, pro were so similar to the birds they lived alongside that the primary difference between them might have simply been feathers. <laughs> yes. Which is especially fun when you fast forward a century and some change <laughs> and we learned that even that was not a difference. Yep. Between them. <laughs> Which is that's that's a a fascinating world to picture this idea that there were birds and non-bird dinosaurs all living it's it's kind of like the confusion between what exactly counts as a rodent for a lot of people where it's like there's a lot of little <laughs> mammals running around and it's hard to tell what's yeah, what it, does a shrew or a mole count they're the same size and it's it's that kind of where it's this thing of there's all these feathery things running around but probably making similar noises <laughs> <laughs> and just the fact some of them can fly better and some of them are losing teeth and that's that's a really cool visual just on the surface it is and we'll talk more about that in a bit but listeners will notice this is the 1870s and famously this was not accepted right away no it wasn't largely because there wasn't a ton of evidence right our understanding of these animals wasn't great and we only had a small number of fossils to go on so some other suggestions became popular at various times Notably, there were two other sort of big suggestions that will often be cited. One was the Walker suggestion, which is that birds originated not within the dinosaurs, but close to the origins of crocodilomorphs. Nice. That they would have been essentially sister, right? The, the closest cousins to the early croc ancestors. 
And this was based on similarities seen between birds and some particular early croc forms. Another even more popular suggestion, suggested by Gerald Heilman, was that they were related to a group of reptiles called the Thecodonts, which are basically just very early archosaurs. Yeah. Sort of this not particularly well-defined group at the time of early archosaurs that weren't dinosaurs and weren't crocs. They were just some other stuff in that yes. same group. This thought became rather popular for a while, starting in the early 1900s. And then there have been some other suggestions. People have pointed at other weird reptiles in, in the evolutionary history of the groups and said, well, those kind of look like birds and those kind of look like birds in some respects. So for decades and decades, people weren't sure. There was back and forth. There were a number of different suggestions trying to figure out where did these birds fit mm -hmm. in the reptile family tree. It's, it's an interesting time to think about because things like this often get portrayed or we like to portray them as like there were the people who had it right from the beginning and everyone else was being ridiculous and way off the mark. But it's very likely that they were all making good observations. Oh, they yeah. just didn't have the info yet. Because it, it always just shown that like we've talked about in uh, other stuff, the whole lone wolf thing of there's the, the group or the yes. few who knew the truth from the beginning. And it's really, they had their hypothesis. Everyone else had theirs. It was just a matter of building data before we figure out which one was closest. Yes. Any of them could have been it, just depending on what the fossil showed. And some of those hypotheses, I've seen it suggested that the Heilman Thecodont ancestry hypothesis became popular in large part because he wrote a lot about it. Mm -hmm. He compiled a lot of evidence and said, look, these, this is all of my extensive reasoning. And people said, right, well, that that's pretty well supported. You have done yeah. a good job putting support to your argument so maybe you're right this sounds good mm -hmm. fast forward several decades to the 1960s more than 100 years after archaeopteryx was discovered and the entrance of a man named john ostrom john ostrich john ostrich no john ostrom <laughs> john ostrom was instrumental in the beginning of what we've talked about before a time period called the dinosaur renaissance yes where we were revisiting a lot of our old ideas about dinosaurs and updating them for a better understanding. Ostrom's contributions to the origins of birds came in the form largely, not entirely, but largely of two famous fossils that he described. First was Deinonychus. Woo. Imagine the raptors from Jurassic Park, very slightly smaller, throw a bunch of feathers on them, that's Deinonychus. And yep. bend their wrists and do all the other correcting stuff. But that's basically <laughs> that's Deinonychus. It's a velociraptor type animal that's about four or five feet tall. Ostrom described Deinonychus, started noting a lot of these bird-like features, linked it with the previously discovered velociraptor and some other animals that would later become known as dromaeosaurs, and started pointing out all of these features that this seemed very active. And look at the... Uh, what does he say? Yes. <laughs> it's like hollow spaces in the vertebrae, just like a bird. And look at the shape of this, just like a bird. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. I was going to say, even Deinonychus? No, wait. That no, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Those are all Jurassic Park quotes. We like that movie. It's the second thing that he described was he re-described an earlier specimen of Archaeopteryx. This was actually the Harlem specimen which was originally identified as a pterodactyl, pterodactylus, he re-identified it as Archaeopteryx, and it has actually since been re-described <laughs> as a different genus, which we talked about in the news not too long ago. Oh, right. Yes, I remember that. But it's still in that same vein, uh, Archaeopteryx-type animals. With his new description of this Archaeopteryx and with Deinonychus and comparing to the decades of other work that had come before that, he went through and listed out this huge comparison through the 1970s he wrote a bunch of articles that laid out all this evidence in one particular article that i looked at from 1976 he literally goes through the different suggestions and says let's look at theropods let's look at early crocodilomorphs let's look at the thecodont suggestion and goes through and compares all the dinosaurs and makes an extremely strong case that birds 
that Archaeopteryx is linked very closely with theropods, the theropod dinosaurs. The other thing that was happening at that time as part of the dinosaur renaissance was the rise of modern cladistics. And we mm -hmm. talked about this in episode 10. Basically, this is a way of arranging organisms, determining their relationships by statistically comparing their features. You throw yes. a bunch of number, you code them, you throw it in a big matrix, you do some math, preferably with the help of a computer, and you <laughs> say, what are the statistically most likely relationships here? And as cladistics started to take off over and over again, we saw birds linked with theropods. Yeah. Over the next few decades, we discovered many more fossils, fossils from many more dinosaurs, fossils from many more birds. We now have about a dozen specimens of Archaeopteryx. And all of this together has given us a very good understanding of exactly what features birds and dinosaurs shared and when those features showed up. A nice progression. So when we come back, we will look at when bird features started to appear in their dinosaur ancestors. So one of the most fascinating realizations that has come out of the last several decades of research has been that many of the features we associate with birds, many of those traits that I listed at the beginning of the episode, are actually dinosaur features. Yes. And have actually been around way before birds. The first bird, Archaeopteryx, and its relatives are around at the end of the Jurassic, right, by 150 million years ago or so. But dinosaurs show up almost 100 million years before that, and even back then they are showing some very characteristic bird-like features. As we mentioned, birds are part of the theropods, and the theropods are the major group of meat-eating dinosaurs. Mostly bipedal, right, standing on two legs, mostly carnivorous. A few features that you find across all or most theropod dinosaurs from T-Rex to Spinosaurus to Dilophosaurus to Gallimimus, include pneumatized bones. Yeah. Bones with those hollow spaces inside of them with that sturdy structure. Possibly that same air sac-based breathing system. Yes. There's yes. evidence that this was present across theropods and in sauropods, the long-necked dinosaurs that are the next group over in terms of relationship. Mm-hmm. Theropods widely have three functional toes. Mm -hmm. They leave behind three-toed footprints, just like birds do. Many of them also have three fingers on their hands. They've reduced two of their five ancestral fingers down to three main fingers, which is what we see in modern birds. One of my favorite things to point out about theropod anatomy is that all across the theropod family tree, Many theropods had a structure that was composed of fused collarbones. Remember, we talked about <laughs> fusion of elements being sort of a bird thing. The collarbones in most theropods were fused together into a, a single structure called a furcula, which you know as a wishbone. Yep. T-Rex had a wishbone. Yes, it did. Most other theropods had this furcula structure in their chest. <laughs> One particular group within the theropods are called the coelurosaurs. Coelurosaurs include several families of dinosaur, theropod dinosaurs. The tyrannosaurs, the ornithomimosaurs, which includes Gallimimus. Yeah. Oviraptor, the, the dromaeosaurs like Velociraptor, a bunch of other groups. All across this group and possibly outside of this group were dozens and dozens of groups of dinosaurs that had feathers. Yes, as it's kind of, we have found specimens now sprinkled throughout yes. these groups. So it, is, it was a surprisingly common feature for something that we, we didn't know that they all had when this <laughs> debate was started. While the dinosaur renaissance was kind of getting going, and as we came to understand that birds are in fact part of this dinosaur group, people started suggesting, paleontologists started suggesting, you know it. We wouldn't be surprising if we started finding dinosaurs with feathers, non-bird dinosaurs with feathers. And then starting in the mid-1990s, 
we found some and then we found more and then we found more (laughs) and now we understand that feathers were not only present before birds but they were present all over the place before birds yeah several all the groups within the coelurosaurs have feathers there are a few groups outside that might have feathers as well and these come in all different shapes and sizes some of these dinosaurs have basic fuzz sort of these little bristles right that the very the most basic version of a feather you can imagine yeah it's, it's it's like fur just very short feathers yes and that could have evolved for body temperature regulation it could have devol- evolved for just being cool to look at. Mm-hmm. Fur and feathers can be very colorful. They can also be a, a protective layer. You know, they, yeah. A lot of birds use that as a as a tougher layer above, you know, between their skin and the the environment. Yeah. You can also use integument like this in part to cool off. Yes, that's very true. There are true. some animals today that do that. Many of these dinosaurs had feathers that were what are what are called plumulose feathers. Which, if you think of the downy feathers that come out of your pillow, that are they don't have a central shaft. Yeah, yeah. They have a little stem, and then it's just a bunch of cotton candy. frilly <laughs> feathery. Yeah, it's like, it's like cotton candy. Plumulose feathers. Baby birds are covered in these yes. today. Lots of dinosaurs show evidence of having plumulose feathers. Evidence impressed in the sediment around their bodies. A.K.A. they were floofy. They were floofy. They were downy. They mm-hmm. were fuzzy, fuzzy creatures. And then there are plenty of dinosaurs that have what are known as pinaceous feathers. And this is what you. This is classic feather when you think yes. of a feather, a stalk down the middle and then veins off to the side like a leaf. Mm-hmm. Very common among birds today. All these different feathers. Again, thermoregulation is a possibility. Especially those big, gaudy, pinaceous feathers were likely used for display. Yeah. Those are great for showing off. And indeed, we find them in many different shapes and sizes on dinosaurs that might have been good for showing off to mates or threat displays or whatever else. Think birds of paradise and and stuff where you're you're reshaping your body by how you hold your feathers. Absolutely. Some dinosaurs had one of these types of feathers. Many of them had multiple types of feathers on their body. Some of them had versions of feathers that we don't see in modern birds. Which is so cool. This wasn't a rare feature. This was extremely widespread across, at the very least, this section of the theropod dinosaur family tree. I have to say, my personal, this is a complete just my own idea, so this doesn't bear any science weight, but <laughs> of thinking of the various ways dinosaurs could be using their feathers and also answering the question of, why does T-Rex have still have such stubby arms? Like, why hasn't it just gotten rid of those? Mm-hmm. I love the picture of T-Rex having very feathered, tiny arms that it can just do little flag waves off its <laughs> chest. Just, I've <laughs> seen that suggested. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That it held on to the feathers as little display. Little fan dance. I held on to the arms. And I, yep. I, that is both adorable and hilarious, but also makes a ton of sense in my head. And I love it. Yup. <laughs> Zooming in slightly more on the bird section of the dinosaur family tree, there is a group of theropods called the Maniraptora. Yes. This includes things like the Dromaeosaurs, things like Oviraptors. The Maniraptorans, many Maniraptorans have yet more bird features, including notably really well-developed arms and hands. Yes. This is a wide group of dinosaurs that commonly had very long arms and very extended hands. Many of them also had a special shoulder joint that allowed them to move their arms not only up and down, but outward and inward. Yes. So like you're going in for a hug. Yeah, exactly. They're having their Swinging arms the arms out. To either side of them. You know, in, in the big clap. A big clap. <laughs> yes, exactly. And combining that with long hands and long arms and claws. These are reptiles after all. Mm-hmm. This was probably great for little running things like Velociraptor and such to grab prey. Yeah, picture to when swing the cat, those arms in. When yes. a cat brings its paws together to pin something between them. Yep. And they had well-developed chest musculature to allow them to do that clapping motion. This was a whole group of dinosaurs that were already adapted to moving their arms out and in for various purposes. Another feature that's very common, this is one of my favorites, <laughs> among the, the Maniraptoran dinosaurs, 
is what's called the semilunate carpal. This is a uniquely shaped wrist bone that allowed them to bend their hand. So if you hold your hand up, listeners, in front of your face with your thumb pointing to your nose and your pinky out, like you're trying to stop the three stooges from poking you in the eyes <laughs> and then bend your hand away from your face, you probably will only get so far. Birds and many of the animals in this group of dinosaurs had that special wrist bone which allowed them to fold their hand that direction down along their arm. Mm -hmm. So when you see birds fold their wings in, they bend at the elbow and they bend at the wrist. And that wrist bend allows them to fold up their, their arms, their wings. Velociraptor could do this. Yeah. Oviraptor could do this. There was a whole group of dinosaurs that had this feature. This group also tended to have not only feathers, they, most or all of them had feathers, but their arms had these long, penacious feathers trailing off of them. When we look at the bones of animals like Velociraptor, we see these nubs on the arm bones where big feathers attach. You see the same thing when you look at turkey bones and, modern, yes. and chicken bones where those long, big arm feathers attached. So they essentially had wings. They weren't flying with them. Most of them, stay tuned. <laughs> these were dinosaurs that had these long feathers coming off their arms. Obviously, these could be display. There's also, speaking of bird features, yes. a number of fossils of oviraptorid dinosaurs and troodontid dinosaurs discovered sitting over their nests of eggs. Mm -hmm. Crouched down, buried rapidly in place, squatting over a nest. And in some of those cases, the dinosaurs have their arms spread out yeah. in a posture that those long feathers on the arms would have been covering up the eggs. And it's fanning a, a canopy over them. Yes. So we've got not only bird anatomical features, but bird-like behavior. Yeah, I mean, we, you can watch birds do that today all over where they will just make a tent out of their wings and then even just pop their head below it. Yes. And when you look at the nests themselves, this group of dinosaurs, those dinosaurs, also had eggshells that were very much like the structure you see in modern-day birds. Mm -hmm. So the point here is that, you know, when we, when we think about evolution of a group and you think about like, oh, well, snakes branched off of lizards and then evolved a bunch of snake features. Yes. And, you know, whales branched off of land-dwelling mammals and evolved a bunch of whale features. Most of the features we think about as being bird features are not only not unique to birds, but were very common in very successful groups of dinosaurs. And helpful, and oftentimes for different reasons. Yes, helpful for catching prey, helpful yeah. for staying warm, for displaying. Another thing that the Manny Raptor and dinosaurs often have are tail feathers. Yes. Long, panacious tail feathers, which might have also been display features. These could be like a rudder while running. There's lots of cool things this could be used for. Absolutely. I think my favorite thing about going through this suite of characters and the fact that they appeared earlier it is like one of the early criticisms, and you'll still hear it come up today for, or, or at least why it is difficult for a lot of people to wrap their mind around the idea of evolution and evolving a feature, a complex feature. Mm -hmm. usually you'll hear it with the eye is what good is right. half an eye you know what good is a partially yes evolved eye and it has been shown since then that every stage of an eyeball evolution has a function mm -hmm. so it it is there but it at on the surface it would be like saying you know oh, i need a camera for this okay well here's a lens seems very counterintuitive you know, what is what good are the features of a bird without being a bird yes what good are feathers without wings what good are wings without yes. hollow bones yeah all that stuff what good are wing what good are flapping arms without feathers yes you know, all of these things came about for very likely different reasons than they would end up being used for you know they weren't flapping because they were bored they were flapping to catch prey they were you know potentially having feathers for insulation or display that then became aerodynamic and it's all of these cool things with alternative or origins in their purpose and that's 
fascinating to me. And it's that beautiful thing of how it's not always going to take the path you expect it to when something arises via evolution. Yes. And what's fascinating to me is exactly what you were pointing out earlier, that if you went back to the late Jurassic period, and especially the Cretaceous, we'll get there in a second, (laughs) there is no good delineation between what is a bird and what's not. What you would have had was a huge diversity of small, feathered dinosaurs, many of which had long arms and hands, many of which were excellent at flapping. Mm -hmm. They weren't flying, but they were excellent at swinging their arms in and out, many of whom were colorful, probably, some of whom sat on their nests. Like, there was this whole not-quite-bird diversity. Which is, it's it's a cool idea that... To pick, I mean, just to picture the age of the dinosaurs as much more like being in a tropical rainforest, you know, on on an yes. island of paradise or something. <laughs> quick, quick shout out for the listeners if you, any of you are interested or enjoy reading web comics. There's a really fun web comic that portrays of velociraptors, uh, very bird like. It's called Manly Guys Doing Manly Things. Uh, <laughs> the website's Machismo is the punchline. Um, it's a great webcomic, but there's a guy who has a bunch of, uh, time travel slash genetic bred pet velociraptors. And the person who draws the comic thought it would be fun to portray them with feathers, but portray them all as poofy, fluffy, pudgy pigeons. Yes. Like angry birds. (laughs) Yep. And so they have this little velociraptor muzzle and then just poofy feathers all over and a big rooster tail coming off the back. Uh, and it's adorable. So look it up if you want to see a really cute interpretation of feathered dinosaurs. <laughs> and indeed, one group among these diverse bird-like dinosaurs would have been the ancestors of true birds. The lineage of true birds, which is often referred to as the avialans, which at their origin were very closely related to the early ancestors of Velociraptor and Troodon. These would have been dinosaurs that had evolved a couple of additional features that are familiar to us. For example, a backwards-facing toe on the back of the foot. The famous pelvis is backward-facing like it is in birds today. The bird pelvis that the wrong half of the dinosaur family tree was named bird pelvis for having. Yep, yep. This includes the animals like Archaeopteryx. These were, once again, small, oftentimes, you know, raven or crow-sized, long tails, retractable toe claws, long feathers on not only the arms, but in many cases the legs, which is had really these long trailing feathers off of them. For a while, Archaeopteryx was the only dinosaur we knew of that fit this sort of category. But in the time since, especially over the last decade or so, we have discovered a number of other dinosaurs that seem to be around this origin of the bird lineage. These include not only other specimens of Archaeopteryx, but a dinosaur called Anchiornis, another called Shoutingia, Aurornis, Eosinopteryx, are all from the late Jurassic of China around 160 million years ago. Some of these are known from only one specimen, Anchiornis is known from hundreds of specimens, and it famously, it was, uh, this is a dinosaur that has been colorized, yes. and you'll see it depicted as black and white wing feathers and then a tuft of red on top of its yes. head. Yes. Uh, the one Archaeopteryx that has been re-identified as a closely related but not Archaeopteryx genus called Ostromia is from late Jurassic Germany. All of these fit that bill of small bipedal, long arms, covered in feathers, but still had the long tail, still had the teeth. Fit the, bill. the bird features have come together in these dinosaurs, but they're not quite birds yet. All these different dinosaurs that I just listed have also been difficult to place on the dinosaur family tree. They have been identified variously as the earliest members of the bird lineage or as the earliest members of the dromaeosaur or troodontid lineage because as we've discussed before the closer you get to the origin of a group the harder it is to tell the branches apart but the earliest members of this lineage that would ultimately give rise to the birds on one hand and the quote raptor dinosaurs 
on the other hand, would have probably looked very much like Archaeopteryx. And I, I'm glad you, you make the distinction that it, it this was not uh, dromaeosaur, you know, raptor dinosaurs coming about and then some of them turning into, but it was, they came from the same group. Yes, the Archaeopteryx-like animals. Mm-hmm. Gave rise on one side to birds and one side to Velociraptor and friends. It, it often gets portrayed as a, just a continual progression through dinosaurs into birds from that group. Same way that the chimpanzees and humans gets confused that we came yes. from. It's we and chimpanzees split from a common ancestor. The dromaeosaurs and birds split from the, a common group or ancestor. Yes. And still at this point, Archaeopteryx and friends are not weird dinosaurs. Yeah. They are very standard dinosaurs. Nothing particularly special about them compared to their relatives. This, at this point, we are at that sort of part bird, part reptile looking thing, right? Mm -hmm. Wings and feathers, but long tails and teeth. There are a few more traits that would come about to transition fully into recognizable bird-like animals. The most obvious one is that at some point they develop the ability to fly. This is another thing that is not totally unique to the bird lineage. We know of at least a couple other dinosaurs in different groups that glided. Microraptor glided on four wings, arms and legs. Yeah. Yi Chi, which is a Scansoriopterigid that was discovered very recently, is the only known dinosaur so far with membranous wings like a bat or a pterosaur yeah it had dragon wings <laughs> yes and was feathered <laughs> yeah so how about that so gliding evolved like these features that had evolved for other purposes right for display or thermoregulation or whatever else had been usurped at least a few different times by dinosaurs small dinosaurs to take to the skies but gliding is actually remarkably common in the animal kingdom yeah that's that's not a, a difficult trait it's it's falling with style yes exactly and it's not a difficult thing to come by in many groups lots of animals have done it only four groups of animals have ever flown <laughs> and birds did it the early animals like archaeopteryx jury's still out lots of studies have been done trying to ask that question could they fly as of right now maybe a little they probably weren't very good at it if they could. I heard it described kind of like how uh, uh, some some ground-dwelling birds like chickens and pheasants can do that, that flutter up to something, but not like sustained long-distance flight. Yeah, so maybe they could have been something like that. Yeah. But before long, certainly by the early Cretaceous, birds had managed to fly. Now, how they got from the ground to the air, <laughs> the question of the origin of flight has been discussed at length. In fact, it's been discussed at length by us. <laughs> yep. So if you want the full discussion on that, go check out episode six, where we discuss the origins of flight. The super quick overview is that there are two general overly simplified <laughs> nodes on this suggestion. That they went from the trees down, which would suggest that they, the earliest bird ancestors before they flew properly were running around in the trees were arboreal and that they would jump out of the trees and begin, right? You've got these long feathers already. These can be used for what's called controlled flapping descent. Mm -hmm. If you've ever seen a flightless or baby bird jump off of something, they kind of flap a bunch to slow themselves down. The chickens in Minecraft do this, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, chickens it's... in Minecraft can't take falling damage because they flap all the way down. Or the... Real birds do this. Cuckoos from Legend of Zelda. When you throw them off stuff, they'll... Yep, yep. <laughs> it's, it's basically using their wings as a parachute and flapping to create yes. the drag. And the idea that this could have ultimately been selected for slowing f descent, guiding descent, gliding really well, yep. and then ultimately flapping to power flight. Just eventually one of them jumped and went to do it and started going the wrong direction. Like, hey, hey, hey! Ah, ah, ah. The trick, as 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 has been taught to flying, is to aim at the ground and miss. Yes. The other suggestion, the opposite suggestion, is ground up. That birds may have started, the earliest birds may have started running along the ground, 
and flapping those long feathered arms to either get a little bit of distance on a jump, to get up to a branch, just that that extra foot or something to get up to that branch. A lot of baby birds today or flightless birds will use their wings to help them climb steep slopes. Yeah. This is called wing assisted incline running. Odds are there may have been a hybrid of these approaches along the evolution of flight. They may have happened multiple times. Yes. It may have happened in multiple ways. Once again, go check out episode six for more details. But one way or the other, before long after Archaeopteryx and friends, true birds had managed to fly. And then something interesting happens because up until this point, as we've mentioned, these animals are not weird. These are pretty standard dinosaurs. The traits that make birds birds showed up gradually across Mm -hmm. the dinosaur family tree and were pretty widespread. But study has shown that once the full collection of things was in place, once you had the, the arms, the anatomy, the feathers, and all that right, just right, perhaps once they started to fly, birds, if you'll excuse the phrase, took off. <laughs> they go from being just another group of dinosaurs to being extraordinarily successful and diverse yeah. in the Cretaceous period. It's, it's like almost once you have all the different tool sets for this lifestyle, you, you can unlock that new skill tree. of Yes, exactly. Now you are, you, you've unlocked this class. And basically it's when evolution goes, essentially birds finally had all of the features they needed to be rudimentary birds. And they looked upon the Cretaceous landscape and saw millions of open niches and said, we, we will fill those niches. That's one of those interesting things with birds is that once they were birds, there are all of a sudden all these niches for them to fill that were not necessarily open because like no one had <laughs> yes. left them. They were just no one. It's like when someone creates a new product. It's like, oh, I didn't know that was a marketplace to be tapped. It's like, yes. Yeah. Here you go. Why, why aren't you guys, you know fishing this way and all the, all these crazy things. So for the rest of this episode, we are going to go through some of the diversity of birds through the Cretaceous period. Now, remember, this is the third and longest period of the age of the dinosaurs. These yes. birds are evolving alongside the Tyrannosaurs and Velociraptor and friends. This is one major diverse group of dinosaurs among many. As we work our way through some quick Flyby, if you'll excuse me. <laughs> As we make our way through this bird diversity, you will notice more familiar features gradually appearing. <laughs> so let's talk about some. One of the early branching groups of birds in the Cretaceous were the Confucius Ornaths, famously represented by the bird Confucius Ornus from early Cretaceous China. This is one of the most well known birds in the fossil record. Hundreds of specimens are known from China. This was a pigeon-sized bird that had a pygo style, that short fused nubbin of a tail that we see in modern day birds shows up as early as the Confucius ornaths. Pygo styles in modern birds, like I said, support that, those tail feathers. Although in Confucius ornaths, those tail feathers weren't necessarily being used for flight. There are many specimens that show long flashy display-worthy tail feathers. Nice. Confucius ornaths still had mobile hands. So they could, these might might have still been grasped, like a bat's hands, perhaps. Yeah. Able to grab. Confucius ornith also was toothless, but many other Cretaceous birds were not yet toothless, which suggests that this showed up multiple times. Confucius ornaths evolved toothlessness on their own. Yeah, that, that was a, a common adaptation some some there was some benefit of getting rid of those pesky teeth yes one of the biggest groups of birds throughout the cretaceous are called the enantiornaths yep. these go from the early to the late cretaceous they are found on all continents except antarctica and let's be honest we probably just haven't found them yet i mean we've done such extensive digging there <laughs> episode 11 antarctica they are known from 
tons of different representatives, genera such as Enantiornis, Avisaurus, Longipteryx, Protopteryx. There are even amber specimens. Recently, there were specimens of an, tiny Enantiornis preserved in amber. Yes. One example of a hatchling and one example that preserved a couple of the wings of these little birds. There were meat eaters, there were fish hunters, there were seed eaters, insect eaters. They lived in deserts, they lived in shores, they were sparrow-sized, they were eagle-sized. This was a hugely diverse and successful group of birds. But they weren't quite still like birds today. They were all or mostly toothed. They still had teeth. Yeah. They were certainly capable of flight, you know, at proper powered flight like birds today, but their wings weren't quite the same, and they probably fl flew differently from modern-day birds. They might not have flown using exactly the same strategy. There's also evidence that they grew differently, that their growth rate through their life was not the same as modern-day birds, and there's evidence that many enantiornaths may have been precocial which is to say, born ready to face the world. Oh. There are a few birds today that do this, that, that are born, parents are out of the way, and they fly pretty soon after they're born. But most birds today, very famously, are pitiful babies. Ah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Will, for the benefit of the listeners, Will opened his mouth as though to receive regurgitated <laughs> meals from a parent. Hungry little fellow. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> but we do see some, the, these are closer to modern day birds, and so we see some more familiar features. Notably, a large sternum mm -hmm. anchoring those flight muscles. Fusion of the ankle and wrist bones with the other elements, like we see in modern day birds. They also have a structure, a feature of the wing called the alula. The alula is the first digit in the bird's hand basically like a thumb that moves separately, has its own feathers attached to it, and is used to modify flight as they're flapping their wings. It's a little oh, extra cool. addition. It's almost kind of, this is probably a terrible analogy, but if you imagine the uh, the flaps on an airplane wing. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. Yep. It's a, a little piece that allows them to change the shape of the wing. It's just like that. We know aviatics. We are very we're airplane aficionados. We I I'm friends with at least two pilots. Oh, some of my best friends are airplanes. <laughs> I I love I love the description of this group and I just kind of want to visually frame it for everyone that these are little flying birds with teeth that potentially are being born and immediately going off like lizards just hatching. <laughs> this sounds like a description of a a sci-fi version of birds of these little small i mean like what we think of just normal bird size but yeah toothed dinosaurs going around and just potentially hatching and then fluttering off and <laughs> flying in a s s potentially some kind of different way so picture a different way to fly yeah it's that's so bizarre and that was just one of the options of what may have led to the birds we have yeah this wasn't like a strange brand like the cousins we don't <laughs> talk about of the birds a crazy hair off the ones yeah this was one of the major lineages of birds this is the major sister lineage to the more familiar birds that include modern day birds this this was normal. This was yeah. what many birds were like if you were in, in the Cretaceous. Yeah, this, you, these would have been filling trees in certain areas you went to, like yes, but replace you know doves or pigeons in your head with these little toothed birds. It's and it's it's such an interesting concept. Moving even closer to modern day birds, even closer relatives include Ichthyornis, hey. the one that Marsh named way back in the eighteen seventies. Ichthyornis is very close to modern birds, which we will call aves. And if you are a bird or dinosaur paleontologist, feel free to yell at us, but we're going to call them aves. <laughs> There's a lot of argument over where exactly to draw the line at bird or avian. or eh, We're going we're gonna to skip that by not really mentioning it very much. <laughs> Ichthyornis is known from lots of specimens across the Midwest of North America. And... 
Once again, a little bit more like modern birds. It's got a much more familiar sternum with a big keel on it. Yeah. It has those fused pelvic structures, a, a, a combined structure called the sin sacrum. It has a tail fan of feathers. It doesn't have those long leg feathers. That is something that was lost along the way to modern day birds. Some of those yeah. other early birds had them. And it's got more parts of the skull that are fused together. Had a beak. Definite beak in Ichthyornis, but still teeth. Yes. So th this is this is getting to the point where it this is now obviously recognizable as what we think of as bird. Yeah. In fact, many representations of Ichthyornis draw it basically like a gull. Yeah. Like a seabird that you'd see today. Just with a couple of things like the teeth and features yes. that are just a little off. So imagine fighting a gull for your french fries, but it has teeth. <laughs> Take your finger. <laughs> One of the other famous groups of Cretaceous birds that are closely related to, to modern birds are the Hesperorniths. And I want to mention these specifically, not for their similarities to modern birds, but for their differences. <laughs> these were very much like Ichthyornis, similar to modern birds, many modern bird features. Hesperornis is famously known across... The northern continents out here in the west. This was another one of those birds Marsh named. Found in marine and freshwater environments, the Hesperornits were specialized for swimming. Many of them had very reduced arms. <laughs> they weren't flying. They had reduced their arms to little vestigial nubs in some cases. They had powerful back legs. They had dense bones like we see in penguins and hippos and other semi-aquatic animals. They had hooked beaks with teeth, still teeth, <laughs> probably eating fish. This was a lineage of not quite birds like we know them today that had evolved to be aquatic, to yeah. live like penguins or other birds that spend their time diving and swimming around in the water to catch food. That's and it's fascinating. What's that, that nice convergent evolution of if you're going to be a bird in the water, there's a couple of body plans that are ideal. Yes, and indeed, you know, it, when I went into this, you know, looking through bird evolution, I was like, okay, yeah, Cretaceous, lots of different birds, and then modern birds eventually. Mm -hmm. But there was this huge variety in Cretaceous birds like birds today, not only aquatic forms. There is an animal known from Argentina called Patagopteryx, not a modern style bird, still, you know, just outside of modern bird features. The size of a hen that has reduced arms, no keel on the sternum, no wishbone, big back legs, and shows every sign of having been secondarily flightless and walking around on land. Fantastic. Like an emu, but, you know, small, <laughs> the size of a chicken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's also evidence from southern France of a bird that's known as Gargantuavis, which appears to be... We're not exactly sure where it fits in the bird family tree. Late Cretaceous, possibly about the size of an ostrich. <laughs> Flightless bird. That's so cool. There was an insane variety of birds during the Cretaceous. There's this myth that you'll often hear about bird evolution that dinosaurs went extinct and then birds were able to evolve. Yes. Not the case. The birds were among the most successful dinosaurs of the Cretaceous period. It's it's to the point where if you were to time travel back to the Cretaceous, it would be very likely that you would not feel the absence of birds. Not at all. Absolutely you, not. You would. It would feel very much like today, where they're just kind of everywhere in all environments, filling uh, all those different roles. Until one of them bit you. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you, you'd feel right at home. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to tell a difference. <laughs> and among this late Cretaceous diversity, there are a few birds that look very, very familiar. Birds that have no teeth. Birds that have fused even more of their skull bones. Birds that their lower jaws are fused together into one chunk. That the beak is dominated by the premaxilla bone, unlike the maxilla, which dominates many other animal jaws. Birds that have fused the leg bones. They have a, a structure called the tibiotarsus, like we see today. The tibia fuses into those ankle bones. 
One such bird is known as Vegavis from Antarctica. This is a modern style bird. In fact, it apparently, based on uh, uh, studies that have been done on it, seems to be part of, or very close to, a group called the Anseriformes, which is the group that includes ducks and geese. Nice. There's another Antarctic bird that might also be an Anseriform as well. This suggests that even though we don't have a ton of fossils of early representatives of modern birds, by the late Cretaceous, at least three major branches of modern-day bird, true avians, true modern birds, had already split. By the late Cretaceous, we would expect to now have the earliest members of the Anseriforms, ducks, geese, and swans. They wouldn't have looked possibly like ducks, geese, and swans, but they would have been the early representatives. The earliest members of the Galliforms, which would go on to be chickens, pheasants, and turkeys. Yeah. And the earliest members of the Paleognaths, which today mostly include the Ratites, ostriches, yeah. emus, cassowaries, and so on. So modern-style birds had already begun to diversify by the end of the Cretaceous. And then there were a bunch of very close relatives, not quite modern, but very close cousins, and then that huge diversity of Cretaceous forms. Just like the features that we identify with birds showed up gradually across the dinosaur family tree, the features of modern recognizable birds were spread out across this incredible Cretaceous diversity of ancient, archaic, wonderful birds. And then there was a really bad day. <laughs> In fact, there was a really bad several hundred thousand years. Yeah. In episode five, we talk at length about what happened at the end of the Cretaceous. But for now, suffice it to say, asteroid, volcanoes, sea level change, environmental disturbance, impact, winter, global cooling, global warming, everything went to hell and there was a very, very big extinction. Yep. As we've mentioned before, there is a common story that the dinosaurs went extinct and birds waltzed through yeah. happily. Not the case. No. Almost all of that late Cretaceous bird diversity disappeared. The Enantiornis, the Hesperornis, Ichthyornis, and friends went extinct. Almost every major branch of birds, as well as all the other major branches of dinosaurs, disappeared completely. Yes. There is some evidence, which we discussed last episode, actually, in the news, yeah. that the only birds that survived might have been ground-dwelling members of the early versions of modern-day bird groups. Whatever it was that survived, the very small portion of birds that made it through this extinction event happened to be part of those toothless beaks, very familiar forms that we know today, because once the dust cleared, they were the only birds around, yeah. and they looked upon the Cenozoic landscape <laughs> and said, look at all these niches that are once again empty. And those few survivors would go on to give rise to the even more astounding diversity of Cenozoic yeah. birds, the birds that have ruled the skies unchallenged by pterosaurs now. Yes. For the last 60 to 65 million years. This is the next radiation. They radiated in the early Cretaceous when they first showed up. Mass extinction, modern birds, av true avies as we know them today would radiate from those few survivors to take over the Cenozoic. But that, listeners, <laughs> is many, many stories for many, many other times. Yes. <laughs> from the beginning of theropods, hollow-boned, wishbones, walking on three toes, to the birds we know today that started at the beginning of the Cenozoic, we hope you have enjoyed this whirlwind tour. <laughs> this this. Uh, some would call it a flyby. Some would call it a flyby. Some have already used that term. <laughs> uh -huh. We're just winging it. Uh, That's the end of our tale for now of bird evolution. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you learned some things. Will, do you have anything else you want to say about birds? Nothing particularly. I, I think one of my favorite things about the, the fact that they diversified, went extinct, and re-diversified is how similar a lot of the forms in the second diversification are to the forms in their first yeah that's really cool to Aquatic me the birds, idea terrestrial mm -hmm. flightless birds 
that it, they it basically just it's like birds acted as a, a gaseous matter just it they <laughs> filled all the niches and then when they were wiped out and relaced back into the same space just refilled it all again yeah well and it it really is that it's just that they were starting from a limited stock now yeah so the replacements all no teeth because yeah the the starting stock had no teeth they yeah. all had this, the features we see today in modern birds because those were the lucky ones that made it through the extinction event. But but for a different turn in evolution, we could have all toothy birds. It could have been the Enantiornithus that survived. Yeah. Or the Hesperornithus. My goodness, imagine if that had happened. The fascinating thing to me is since we already saw that maybe toothlessness popped up on its own, if it would have popped up again. Uh, that idea of would, would we have still ended up with basically modern birds because those features are the beneficial ones interesting the and world may never know we'll we'll get to some subject basing on that kind of idea eventually in the episodes who knows when <laughs> <laughs> for now we would like to thank the listeners for listening as always thanks to our 3.2 billion requesters of this subject <laughs> we hope that you enjoyed it we're super excited that people were so excited to hear about this i just it just kept coming up on the comments and the request forms which was awesome it sure did as always we are open to requests if you have more questions following this episode let us know if you have other subjects you want to hear about we we take requests yes look look what we look what we have done <laughs> As always, we will put lots of additional info, pictures, links, links to the news articles in our blog. So keep an eye out for the blog post. Always feel free to contact us with requests, with feedback, with comments, with questions. We're across the social medias. If you want to hear how to contact us, listen through the outro for that information. We release episodes every fortnight, at least main series episodes every fortnight <laughs> it's june so we're doing that special jurassic park thing and maybe there will be other special episodes coming out only time schedule and we eventually will tell maybe there's more to talk about with birds who knows i certainly do so join <laughs> us again in the future keep an eye out for our future episodes i, I don't have a bird pun to sign off on i thought i might be able to come up with one real quick that's okay. I feel like there's a Twitter joke that we missed somewhere, but I don't... We'll we'll think about it, and then we'll edit it in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'll think we're extremely clever. We're very, very clever. That's all for now, folks. <laughs> just, just do, for now, just go ahead and now go, oh, oh, oh what a clever... What end. a clever... Oh, oh Will. Oh, that's why we keep side. you around. Play the all outro right. music. That's, that's where we'll put it. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.